Okay, so what exactly, I mean, I have the, uh, the what the new CDD is, um, and when does it go into effect, and what exactly is it? Well, as a parent and a Minneapolis resident, mm -hmm. I would have to say that what's happening right now with the CDD is pretty confusing. Okay. Uh, the information <laughs> changes on a regular basis. So families have to scour the website oh, they for got Minneapolis Public Schools for constant updates. Yeah. They put out videos yeah. um, pretty much on a weekly basis since yeah. uh, December, trying to give additional information and explanations about what's happening. Yeah. So there is a lot of confusion surrounding the CDD. There is an FAQ sheet. Mm -hmm. that is uh, included on the website as well as key documents. Mm -hmm. Now, to the best of my ability in terms of deciphering what is happening, um, it looks as though the district has created a new plan that is focused on uh, supposedly increasing equity within the district by redrawing some of the school boundary lines okay. um, and um, shifting around students Okay. From one part of the city to the next. Yeah. Um, and then as well, uh, making the majority of schools that are um, currently, let's say, K through eight, mm -hmm. um, having them become uh, K through five schools. Okay. Uh, solely elementary mm -hmm. or middle schools, which would be six through eight. Yeah. And then some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of clarity in terms of what that will actually look like and how disruptive that will be to students in particular neighborhoods. Um, the other aspect of this program uh, that the uh, district is putting forward has to do with their ability to cut transportation costs. Oh. If they're shifting around students, um, the expectation is that they will find a way to streamline transportation, decrease costs mm -hmm. by millions of dollars. Okay. Um, beyond that, another goal of the CDD is also to increase racial and economic integration in classrooms inside of Minneapolis Public Schools. Can we define what that is? Racial and economic integration within classrooms. What does that mean to you? Well, my guess is that the district is focusing on um, the high number of schools within Minneapolis public schools that have a high concentration of students of color and students who receive free and reduced lunch. Yeah. While on the other hand, they have a select number of schools that have an overwhelming majority of white students mm -hmm. and um, students who are from um, higher um, socioeconomic levels. Okay. And so they are defining those schools in terms of uh, school, those schools being racially isolated, for example. Ah, uh, got it. So I have a completely different perspective about a lot of these issues. Not only am I a, a resident of North Minneapolis, but I'm also a civil rights attorney. Mm -hmm. And I'm also co-counsel on a major education case called Gru Cruz Guzman, mm -hmm. which is right now uh, currently in mediation. This case has been going on for nearly four years. That's what I heard, so yeah. a lot of the language that I have seen on the district's website mirror some of the language that is included in the Cruz Guzman lawsuit. And so my question and my concern is whether or not the district is making some of these moves with the CDD mm -hmm. in response to the Cruz Guzman lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, my role as a co-counsel in the case is uh, on behalf of three charter schools. We're charter school interveners. Mm -hmm. that serve primarily students of color, mm -hmm. uh, as well as students who receive free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. We've raised a number of questions about uh, some of the terminology being used in the Cruz Guzman litigation, such as focusing on racially isolated schools and calling those schools segregated. Mm. Um, we argue that um, schools that have a high concentration of students of color yeah. are not necessarily segregated within the context of Brown versus the Board of Education and Civil Rights History. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, it's a completely different framework, especially when you're looking at a place like the Twin Cities, mm -hmm. which is extremely racially and ethnically diverse. Um, 
you know, the district, Minneapolis Public Schools is comprised of about 66% students of color. Oh, really? Not 66% of black students or 66% of Latinx students or 66% yeah. of Hmong students. 66% of students of color, mm -hmm. which would include native born African American students, mm -hmm. Somali students, Hmong students, American Indian students, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so that to me constitutes actually a very high degree of racial diversity, not necessarily segregation. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand that within the context of um, that level of racial and ethnic diversity, uh, there are going to be students who speak different languages, who yeah. have different cultural backgrounds, and who have very rich cultural, cultural and ethnic traditions mm -hmm. that should not all be lumped in together yeah. and then juxtaposed against schools that have a higher, a high concentration of primarily white students. Yeah. yeah. You know. And so with, with, with that being said, I mean, I, I want to get to the, the, the core of, of what you just said and how that is going to affect the North side, but people watching, I want them to understand, uh, you say that, um, Minneapolis is, is diverse. However, would it be safe to say that there's a segregation in Minneapolis between the North side and the, and, and the South side of Minneapolis, just to give people a picture of what's going on? Well, I would say that there is a great deal of racial segregation in the city of Minneapolis. We know yeah. that redlining uh, has played a role in terms of where people could historically buy houses or even you know where they could rent. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that there's a deep economic divide within yeah. the city of Minneapolis that often falls along racial and ethnic lines. Yeah. Um, beyond that, you know, Minneapolis and the Twin Cities uh, has been ranked as one of the worst places in the country for black, black people, people to live. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of that has to do with the disparities across every key indicator of quality of life. And so given those deep disparities, given the fact that communities of color are often left behind yeah. in terms of having access to economic opportunity, access to uh, higher education, the list goes on and on, adequate health care. Mm -hmm. Those same disparities are going to play a role in what is happening in our public education system. And so often right now within the district, um, the, the quality of education that a student will receive has to do with where they live. Yeah. So there are schools in, let's say, for example, Southwest Minneapolis, yeah. which is known to be a whiter, more affluent part of the city yeah. um, that has some of the best educational offerings within the city. Yeah. So right there is a built in disparity mm -hmm. within the city um, that has to do with economic zip code and some would argue race as well. And so the flip side of that is that students who live in my area of the city, such as North Minneapolis, yeah. that has a high concentration of people of color, mm -hmm. um, higher, constant, higher um, uh, percentages of people who are unemployed and underemployed mm -hmm. and lower incomes, mm -hmm. the quality of education typically goes down in this part of the city. One thing that I wanna make clear is that um, student academic achievement has very little to do with the capability of the students in question and everything to do with the systemic barriers that have been put in place mm -hmm. that allow for an, a greater distribution of resources to be uh, placed in the wider, more affluent parts of the yeah. city. P a part of the city where if people wanted to send their children to private school, for example, they could afford it. Yeah. Versus many of our students of color who are often um, placed on the margins of society, locked out of opportunity, and fully capable of achieving academic success if they have high quality teachers, mm -hmm. if they have um, buildings that are functioning properly, if they have curriculum that is uh, culturally responsive, mm -hmm. and um, if they are not uh, criminalized yeah. within the school system. Yeah. And so those are some of the challenges that we see in place but those challenges are not going to be addressed by this new CDD plan that the district is um, is proposing. Put, or, proposing, yes. And, and so, the, and you said that it's, it's changing all the time, or it's confusing. I also saw on the page that there's a comprehensive comprehensive district design digest, like like literally there's a 
like a, a weekly magazine, I don't know what it is, <laughs> which kind of speaks to the, the, the transformation that's, t that's taking place. So what it says on the website is that the, the what is the comprehensive district design examines and makes recommendations on how Minneapolis Public Schools educate students, how the school system works to meet the needs of underserved populations, and how we ensure resources are available to meet our goals. The potential is that it eliminates long-standing policies and practices that disadvantage students of color and low-income students. Um, and why it's needed is, it, on the website it says, Minneapolis Public Schools' current um, structure deprives a significant number of students, especially students of color and low-income students, of a well-rounded education. And some of this speaks directly to what you just said. So my question is, if, if I'm watching this or listening in, if that's what it says on the website, and you're saying this is what we need to uh, almost like rehabilitate uh, the city uh, serving young people of color, why wouldn't, this, why wouldn't this add up to what you're saying needs to be done? Well, one reason that it doesn't add up is because the district has not demonstrated any level of competency yeah. in terms of implementing any of its previous plans mm -hmm. and seeing those plans result in a higher academic performance and achievement mm -hmm. for students of color. Mm -hmm. So why should we believe the district now that this new aha moment and this um, plan that is being proposed, this convoluted plan, this confusing plan, this plan that seems to be ever evolving will actually work to address the educational inequities within the system. Now, there's a few different things we need to look at. Number one, every year the district loses 1,500 students. Mm -hmm. Over 80% of those students are students of color. Wow. And so that means that- but that's um, not to graduation. Hmm? That's not to graduation. No, not to graduation. That's the students finding other places to be educated. Okay. So we have lost a number of students to uh, surrounding suburban schools, to mm -hmm. charter schools as well. And that is a huge problem for the district because the money follows the students. Yeah. So if there are bleeding students left and right, that means that they're not going to be able to meet their budget every year, um, which of course has an impact on their bottom line, their ability to retain uh, teachers and high quality programming, et cetera. This has been going on for years. Yeah. And rather than get to the root of why parents of color are removing their children from Minneapolis public schools at alarming rates, we now have a plan that's being proposed that um, has been proposed with very little community input. This mm. is not what the community is asking for. Mm -hmm. uh, bureaucrats have come up and probably consultants with this plan that will be extremely disruptive to students all across the district and without comprehensive, concrete information on how it will work in actuality. Yeah. Um, I know that the district is saying that they want to uh, increase access to equity for students of color. If that's the case, the first place that the district needs to look is the policies mm -hmm. that have perpetually, uh, have virtually created a school to prison pipeline where mm -hmm. uh, students of color, particularly African American boys, are punished at an alarming rate yeah. in comparison to their white counterparts and mm -hmm. often for nonviolent offenses, nonviolent reasons. Um, they are being um, placed in alternative schools at alarming rates. Yeah. They're also being um, labeled at alarming rates and placed in special education. Mm -hmm. Our special education system within the Minneapolis public schools is abysmal. Yeah. It has been evaluated. Yeah. It has been found to be abysmal. This plan does nothing yeah. to right. address the over 6,000 students who are receiving yeah. a below subpar education. Yeah, and I've actually worked in special uh, education in different cities outside of in suburbs and in Minneapolis and the disparity between the two is it's it's a grand canyon it it's, is yeah, it is it's canyon. egregious right so yeah. when you see those types of uh, policies that are leading to some of these outcomes mm -hmm. not being addressed in this plan you know where does that leave us right again in terms of believing that switching around a bunch of students is actually going to result in the changes that we want to see it's odd because it's the way, the way that you just put it, it's let's sh reshuffle the cards almost. It's like, but yes. why can't we, why can't we get like a new table and maybe some new cards or like what's going on? Like it, it almost sounds like a reshuffle and it, I, I guess it just doesn't, it doesn't address the root. And I want to get to the root that you were referencing earlier, but before I, I do that, I want to get straight to the question that prompted this because I heard from some families in here on the north side, how is the comprehensive district design going to affect families on the north side? 
Well, it could have a tremendous impact of, um, on families um, who live in North Minneapolis. I mean, uh -huh. number one, if families want to send their children t to their K through eight neighborhood school, that may no longer be a, an option if the schools become K through five mm. or six through eighth grade. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also unclear um, whether students will have to be bused, you know, one way or the other, or will have to now walk, you know, to a so-called community school. Yeah. Um, beyond that, there could be students from across Minneapolis now coming to school in North Minneapolis and in Northeast Minneapolis who are not acclimated to the environment, who are, who feel, you know, hostility yeah. <laughs> towards this community. Yeah. And who also, in all honesty, because they are, will likely be white and middle or upper middle class, will likely still receive special treatment inside mm. of the school system, regardless of where they go. So the, the treatment's gonna be the same. The treatment, it's most likely that the treatment's gonna be the same, even though the, the student is changing status. Absolutely, as a matter of fact, they may receive heightened treatment wow. because of the district's desire to hang on to those students that are helping to keep the, um, the test scores you know, at a certain level within the district. Uh -huh. So there is a real fear right now that a lot of those parents in South and Southwest oh. are going to take their children out of Minneapolis public schools. Mm -hmm. And so the statistics right now that they hold up, which are not great, but are pretty good for white students, are going to plummet dramatically mm. if they remove their children out of the school district. And so imagine a district having that kind of fear of losing um, the income that comes with those students, mm -hmm. the political capital that comes with those students, the yeah. test scores that comes with those students, and if their parents decide to keep them within Minneapolis public schools, you best believe the district is going to be bending over ba backwards to yeah. make sure that those parents are pleased with the new plan. Okay. That also means that if those parents really begin to raise hell yeah. about the plan and its impact on their kids, the district will run, you know, do a backflip yeah, yeah, yeah. and switch things around to accommodate mm -hmm. those parents. We have seen this happen time and time again, where the political clout of the parents in Southwest Minneapolis dictate what happens in the district. Wow. That's part of why we have the disparities to begin with in terms of a disproportionate amount of the resources in terms of, and I'm talking about human resources, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about financial resources being placed in Southwest Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. That is completely by design. That has everything to do with the priorities of the district, mm -hmm. as well as school board leaders who have advocated for those resources mm -hmm. to be placed there, as well as teacher self-selection in terms of where they want to teach. We have so many teachers who do not want to teach kids on the north side who unfortunately uh, do not see the value mm -hmm. of our children in North Minneapolis yeah. and who think that those are plum assignments to be placed in schools in South and Southwest Minneapolis. So now imagine those teachers being forced to uh, teach in North Minneapolis. They don't want to do so. Mm -hmm. um, that, from my perspective, is not going to address these underlying issues that we're talking about in terms of inequitable education. And, and it's even if, if that's the effect, I think paired with that in what you were saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's also what is this comprehensive district design saying to the North Side as well? And it, it sounds to me that if, if that's the way that it plays out, um, it sounds like what it's saying is we, we, we want to bring the money and capital and clout from the Southwest side into this, this other side of the city, which would inversely say um, the, the, the community here doesn't have enough power for us to, to, to lift our pen, or we don't, we don't care about you. Right. And, and, and that, that to me, I don't, I don't know how you reconcile that, that connection. Like, where do you, if, if, if this move is a reshuffle, and, and, and if, and what, what you're saying, what I'm interpreting from it is that it says NPS is basically saying that the North Side is, is or is, is in, in some way is just not worth it. I mean, or we, we need to bring in other students to, you know, uh, up the value or, or something in mm -hmm. that, in that, in that uh, lane. It, my question is that then how do you how do you approach it like at the root like what is the root problem instead if if the CDD is not going to work uh, what would be the root issue like how do we how do we change Minneapolis public schools from being historically one of the worst um, 
school systems for kids of color being well, one of the worst uh, school systems for special education. How do we deal with the root? Where do we start? Well, I think the first place we need to start is acknowledging the depths and the impacts of white supremacy mm -hmm. upon Minneapolis public schools throughout its operations, throughout yeah. its decision making. Uh, even in looking at the fact that the um, district is comprised of about 66, 67 percent students of color, um, but only 16 percent of the teachers are teachers of color. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem right there. Wow. Right. There is not adequate representation in terms of who is teaching our kids. Mm -hmm. We know that the curriculum that shoes is outdated and it's ineffective. It's not keeping up with the technological pace that's happening in the United States and globally. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, the curriculum is not culturally relevant or responsive. Yeah. And so students can go into their history class and, and not see themselves or their ancestors represented in the materials. Yeah. So that's a huge disconnect. Um, beyond that, as I mentioned earlier, the punitive approach that schools often take, it's a reflection of anti-blackness mm -hmm. and white supremacy within Minneapolis public schools. When black students are singled out mm -hmm. for behavioral issues, when they are um, the subject of um, disciplinary proceedings so that mm -hmm. include school resource officers that bring them into the juvenile justice system. Yeah. So already they're receiving juvenile records as children, wow. right? Which is uh, impacting their access to opportunity mm -hmm. when they are singled out for special education and emotional behavior disorders. So if you look at something like EBD, which some people may think is benign, some people may think it's legit. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is when students, overwhelmingly black students are labeled as EBD, the person diagnosing them doesn't have to have a strong clinical background. They can major in anything at the undergrad level. Mm -hmm. As long as they take a master's program in EBD, our uh, school system has said that that's enough to be able to label a kid as EBD. Wow. Now think about all the implications of being labeled as EBD and there's nothing wrong with you because it's such an ambiguous definition that even defines what EBD is. Yeah. Any of us can be labeled as EBD, yeah. but the implications for a black child being mislabeled as EBD by mostly white people who don't have any real cultural competency is significant. Mm -hmm. Because again, they're gonna be placed in a beyond subpar um, special education system that is already under-resourced, mm -hmm. uh, where um, a lot of the staff are not culturally competent, unfortunately. They may be well-meaning, but they're not culturally competent. Mm -hmm. um, and then placed in alternative schools. I mean, all of that is just a form of tracking that happens. Mm -hmm. Some of these kids are actually brilliant, but they're not being given access to um, uh, gifted and talented programs, yeah. um, high quality opportunities that mm -hmm. can um, lead them on a pathway to college and career versus a pathway to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. You also have prejudice that is, and bias that is not being talked about, but that plays a role in yeah. terms of how students are treated and the, the, what some call the soft bigotry of low expectations. The soft that, bigotry of, of low, low expe expectations wow. that permeate too many of our classrooms yeah. within Minneapolis public schools. Uh -huh. And it plays a role in terms of, again, who gets access to opportunity and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that mindset plays out in terms of, again, where teachers are assigned. So if you look at um, our teaching core in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. again, um, you know, high percentage of white teachers, of course, but also uh, the teachers with the least amount of experience and the um, lowest credentials are overwhelmingly assigned to schools in North Minneapolis. Wow. And the studies show that having a high quality teacher is the single greatest predictor of um, academic success, mm -hmm. more so than income, yeah. family composition, like yeah. whether someone's raised by a single mom, for example, yeah. having a high quality teacher can overcome yeah. a lot of those obstacles wow. and actually lead to academic success. But that's what we're not doing. We're mm -hmm. not making sure that um, high quality teachers are overwhelmingly placed in North Minneapolis to try to make up for some of the other gaps that our families and our children experience here. Yeah. So the system is replicating the inequities by design, uh. right? And this is a way of masking a lot of those inequities by, again, I just keep thinking of a magician with some cups, yeah. right? And yeah. just <laughs> moving the ball around yeah. and, and trying to make you think this is what it is when yeah. it's really that. And, and that, again, that's the effect of it. And it also, I, I come back to what it's communicating as well. And that, do they actually believe that 
families on the north side will believe this language that, hey, this is going to help my kid or my, my, this, 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 this community that's, you know, uh, majority of color and, and, and low income. Like, it, do they really, do they actually, do you think that NPS believes that families are, are buying this on the north side? I think that they want families to buy it mm -hmm. because they, that's a way of being able to pit Southwest families against North side families to say, see, this is racist for you guys to raise these concerns. Now, some people might have <laughs> racial prejudices in their hearts yeah. and they may not give a damn about kids on the North side. Like that's just the truth, right? Yeah, some yeah, yeah, are yeah. well-meaning, some really don't care. Yeah. But the point is that the district owes it to North side families to explain unequivocally yeah. how this will benefit our children and how they will address these underlying inequities that are built into the system that they have not touched with the 10 foot pole, such as the things we've talked about, like yeah. special education, discipline disparities, and not making high quality programming available yeah. on the north side. What would make you believe that Minneapolis public schools, because you, you said they have a long history of, of kicking the can down the road or you know, switching the ball in the cups, or they have a long history of not serving uh, students of color and uh, students in special education, and also a long history of um, just kind of empty uh, promises. What would make you believe that they're going to do something that's going to have lasting and significant change? Right now, nothing. Okay. So then what do we, where do we go from? <laughs> what, what do we do? Do we replace the people or how, how, do we, how do we fix this? If, so we've identified the problem and the issue and, and how we feel about it. Where do we go from here? Well, the reality is that we've been identifying the problem and the issue for years. Yeah, and yeah, they it, still never we got addressed it. We got it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is not responsive mm -hmm. to what people are saying is the problem. Okay. This is their, you know, creative idea, mm -hmm. what they think will work, but mm -hmm. this does not get to the heart of the underlying issues within the system that we have brought forward time and time again. Yeah. Um, I do believe that um, they really have to overhaul their system. Yeah. And they need to take a narrowly tailored approach when they are thinking uh, about families on the north side. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah. a one size fits all <clears throat> approach. They need to look specifically yeah. at the issues here. Yeah. Right? They need to look at the um, the quality of the schools that we have here. You know, like uh, I think a lot of north side families for example would like some aspects of the plan such as you know some schools becoming magnet schools. Mm -hmm. Right? Cuz there are high quality magnet schools around the country that have um, opened the door to higher academic outcomes for students of color. Mm -hmm. We don't need to shuffle kids from Southwest Minneapolis mm -hmm. to have a high quality magnet school program right here in North Minneapolis. And we don't have to have our classrooms with 20%, 30%, 40% of white students in order to make them legitimate learning environments, right? Mm -hmm. Because their focus on integration gives the sense that um, our students aren't going to achieve unless they're sitting next to affluent white kids. Are they literally going to bus kids from the southwest side of Minneapolis to the north side? Well, that's very possible in terms of how they draw the boundary lines. Have you seen and the boundary they, lines? I mean, have, do we have a picture of it yet? Or not, like I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Um, I know that they're saying it's still unfolding. That is a possibility, especially because they want to create some citywide schools, some citywide magnet schools. Okay. And so those schools could draw kids from all across the district to attend okay. uh, a magnet school. And I'm not opposed to that, right? If yeah. that is what some parents choose, I think parent choice is paramount um, to um, opening the door to opportunities for students. So I'm not opposed to that. But at the same time, there's no reason why with the, with the diverse populations we have here, they can't build high quality magnet schools and STEM programs right in our own community. Yeah. We don't have to have kids coming from all across the city yeah. in order for them to clean up what they're already doing and overhaul it. Yeah. You know, and to make sure that our teaching core is strong, our teaching core is diverse. Mm -hmm. That again, they, they dismantle the school to prison pipeline in mm -hmm. North Minneapolis. These are things they can do without the CDD. And address the legacy of white supremacy as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So why haven't they done that? Why go through a complicated convoluted process that does not include community engagement mm -hmm. and all these empty promises yeah. and have us wishing upon a star that it'll actually work. Yeah, so what's, when, what's going to work for Southwest Minneapolis is probably not gonna work for the North Side. I mean, and to put them in the same you know, conversation is, is almost a little offensive in and of itself. Yes. 
that's saying, well, you know, all in together now. It's like, has it been all in together? <laughs> exactly. Like, ever? Uh, so now and it gives the sense that by putting this plan in place, they're taking away something from South and Southwest Minneapolis, which again, makes people feel threatened. It makes mm -hmm. them dig in their heels. It makes our kids now become the enemy. You know, when our kids are just trying to get a decent education, they're trying to walk down mm -hmm. the street and go to school and be treated with dignity and respect yeah. and have access to opportunity. Yeah. In the short and long term. That's all they're really asking for. Yeah. And to go in high quality buildings, not dilapidated buildings, not outdated programs, not outdated curriculum. Mm -hmm. They want equitable access. Right. So if you had some of the benefits and the resources that are in southwest Minneapolis, we should be able to have that here. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't have to disrupt the entire infrastructure in order to augment what we have here or to overhaul it yeah. for the benefit of Northside children. Mm -hmm. So next week, the 27th, uh, what, what I heard from Kenneth is that they're still gonna go through with uh, some, some semblance of proposing the plan or passing it through, and then it goes into action when? And, and um, April, from my understanding, is when they will vote on the plan. Yeah. And then um, some of the main recommendations that they're planning to make will happen in the 2021 mm -hmm. 22 school year. Is there anything people watching this can do at all? Um, Cause one of the, the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to, to have this forum and sit down and speak with you is to also find some lane of civic engagement or empowerment that people can feel in the conversation. And, is, is there any way, uh, what's the first step, I guess, to, to getting engaged in this, in this conversation or having you know, some type of uh, uh, empowerment in it? Well, I think that this is an important step that you've taken uh -huh. in terms of trying to make Northside families aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I don't think most families are even aware that this is happening. Yeah, I mean, the, the language is there, but it's also it's the fact clear. that- It's not clear. It's not No, no, it's written. super vague. Super right, vague. I'm an attorney and I had to work to decipher what exactly they were talking about, right? Yeah, and the yeah. average family shouldn't have to have a law degree to understand what's going on. Yep. So they need to synthesize the information and they need to narrowly tailor it to the interests of Northside family so people can understand very clearly, mm -hmm. this is how this will impact my community. Yeah. And this is how this will impact my children's access to education. Yeah. They have to do that. Um, beyond that, um, I think that they need to push pause on this entire process. Yeah. They need to go back and get actual community input about what we want. Yeah. And they need to address some of the underlying systemic challenges that we talked about, like yeah. what's happening with special education, what's happening with the teaching core lacking diversity, as well as um, less experienced, um, lower credential teachers yeah. being placed in North Side schools. Mm -hmm. um, and then how are they going to augment the programs that are already here, you know, like for example, the things that are effective, that are working, that people love, yeah. how do they multiply that and ensure yeah. that there are adequate resources there? Yeah. And then how do they bring innovation within the North side so mm -hmm. that our students can have access to the highest levels of technology, uh, magnet school offerings, et yeah. cetera. Yeah. You know, again, without disrupting our children, they go through enough, yeah. you know, and they sh should be able to, if they want to walk down the street and go to their community school, mm -hmm. they should be able to go and have access to a high quality education. Yeah. Well, I look forward to continuing this conversation because I don't think it stops here. And I, I, I want to get, you know, Kenneth here and I want to get you and Kenneth in the same room and possibly Chief Moore um, to really break down what's going to happen because it, it, this is happening fast. Mm -hmm. This is coming up real quick. And with this much vague language towards it and it's coming up, it's, it, it almost sounds a little bit dangerous as to what's going to exactly happen. Yes. And is a danger in us not knowing. And if you as a lawyer, you know, need to pick through and figure it out. I mean, a family on the North side, I mean, there's already, you're already living life, you know, like, right. how am I going to pick through this thing? So um, I look forward to, to uh, continuing this conversation and seeing how this, this plays out. But for right now, it sounds like what people can do. I mean, is this something to do with like, you know, be careful of who you vote for your representatives or... Is this an issue that people can bring to their to their their community leaders, or who? How would they, you know, civically engage with this? Does it start with representatives or senators or what? 
Well, it, it starts now, right now, at the local level. So yeah. if when there are school board meetings about mm -hmm. this issue, yeah. parents need to show up okay. and ask questions. Got they it. can go to the website that talks about the CDD yeah. and go to the FAQ, which answers some of the critical questions people have been asking. Yeah. There are videos as well that they can watch and they, could, they should write down any questions that they have mm -hmm. and they should just bring it to the district, yeah. bring it to the school board members, bring it to the superintendent because they are ultimately the decision makers mm -hmm. about whether or not this CDD is actually implemented. Yeah. And they also will have to become very strong advocates for what they want to see for their kids, right? Yeah. If they want to see more black male teachers, they want to see more Hmong teachers, they want whatever they want to see, yeah. they have to go and advocate and they have to be vigilant about that. Yeah. So that means getting to know their school board members. We mm -hmm. have an election coming up um, and we will elect a new school board member to represent North Minneapolis. Okay. They okay. should know who those candidates are. When does that happen? Uh, the election should be happening in November. Okay. But there are conventions and things that will be scheduled probably over the summer. Yeah. So they will have to pay attention to what is going on um, so that they can get to know the candidates, see what they stand for, put their requests, questions, and demands on the table, and then make an informed decision yeah. about who they want to vote for. Got That's going to make a huge difference. Okay. But really, right now, it's becoming informed. It's showing up. Mm -hmm. It's advocating for what they want to see for their children. Okay. All right, well, I look forward to talking to you more about this down the line and, and, and seeing where this goes. Uh, and thank you so much for the time today. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah.